Hey, so this is our second video for Haemoglobin and um, the first one we covered a lot of content so I want to just take the opportunity before we do some more um, to recap what we've done so far um, before we move on. Okay, so we're going to use the Quizlet, just the first eight slides to recap what we've done. So this is a reminder that you've got Quizlets for all of your topics and it's a really good opportunity now we're doing remote learning to use them as often as you can, particularly if you've got the app on your phone. So this is the haemoglobin set, okay? And the first question is, describe how a red blood cell is adapted to its function. Now what you can do is keep pausing your video now, having a go at answering the questions, and then unpausing to go through them, okay? So the answer should be, it's by a concave, giving it a larger surface, to area, uh, surface area to volume, ratio that I should say to enable oxygen to diffuse into the cell more readily it has no nucleus to make space more space for more haemoglobin okay, next one describe the structure of haemoglobin it has quaternary structure containing four polypeptide chains do you remember two alpha two beta each is associated with a heme group containing an ion ion. Each ion ion can combine with one oxygen molecule. So that means four oxygen molecules can be carried per haemoglobin if it is fully saturated. And remember, we call it oxyhemoglobin when it is carrying oxygen. Okay, the next two, slide, uh, two cards cover two important key terms. Now, you can either use the term loading when describing haemoglobin uh, uh, and its relationship with oxygen or associating either or they mean the same thing but what do they mean they mean that haemoglobin is binding to oxygen so we have the alternative as well so uh, what is meant by unloading and or dissociation this is when haemoglobin releases oxygen mm -hmm. so we use these two key terms when describing what happens um, at the respiring site and at the uh, gas exchange site so the gas exchange site that's when oxygen binds to haemoglobin so it's being loaded At the respiring tissue site that is when oxygen is being unloaded so it is released from the haemoglobin okay so moving on to our next card now this is really the trickiest one this is why oxygen and uh, the oxygen dissociation curve the graph that we looked at last video is s shape s shaped okay so the structure of haemoglobin makes it difficult for the first molecule of oxygen to bind as its subunits are tightly packed together. The structure or shape of haemoglobin changes when the first oxygen binds, which allows more oxygen to bind easily and so a greater saturation with oxygen. Because the first oxygen binding changes the shape so the second can bind more easily we refer to this as cooperative binding and remember on the graph this is what causes the gradient to become steeper in the middle so if i remind you by showing you um, on the graph okay so at first when we've got low concentrations of oxygen low partial pressure of oxygen on only some of the haemoglobin will have one oxygen bound at that time most of it won't have any oxygen bound at all so it won't be associating or loading it readily but then as most of the haemoglobin now has one oxygen bound to it the second one binds more easily and the third giving you that steeper curve it then tails off again because it's an f shape and that's on the card as well there at the bottom so the gradient steepens, the third molecule binds with relative ease, the fourth molecule finds it harder to bind now because there's a lower chance of it finding a free 
binding sites because three out of four are occupied. Okay, so you're going to have to practice that one. That's pretty tricky on the new spec. They have asked that one. Um, on the old spec, they didn't even ask you to understand the F shape. So it is quite a high level concept. Okay, the next one then, we're thinking about why the oxygen loads at the lungs or gills, so the gas exchange site. Remember, at the gas exchange site, the first thing you'll write is it has a higher partial pressure of oxygen. Under those conditions, haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, and so it loads more readily. That means it gives it gives the haemoglobin a higher saturation under those conditions. And you can see that in the graph, because if we pick a high partial pressure of oxygen and we read up, the graph tells you tells us that all the haemoglobin more or less is carrying four oxygens. We're nearly at hundred percent saturation, which tells you that under those conditions it is readily loading the oxygen. Okay, so the opposite is true then for the respiring tissues. Why is it unloading? At, at the lower uh, partial pressure of oxygen, haemoglobin has a low affinity for oxygen and it unloads more readily then, giving a lower saturation of haemoglobin in the respiring tissues. So if you have a look at the graph, this is true. You can see under low partial pressure, very low saturation telling you that haemoglobin under those conditions is unloading oxygen rather than taking it or bind, uh, binding from it rather than binding to it. Okay, so the last one to look at, and this will link to what we're going to do later on, links to what you know about protein structure. Why are there different haemoglobins? So different species have got different haemoglobins. So the answer is each species produces a haemoglobin with a slightly different primary structure. Um, the haemoglobin of each species therefore has a slightly different tertiary structure to each of its chains and that gives it a different quaternary structure. And that results in different properties. So I've said hence different oxygen binding properties. So it may have a higher or a lower affinity for oxygen at the same partial pressure as we'll see later on. Okay, right, so we'll pause there, Charlotte. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move in your keynotes to the Bohr shift and the effect of carbon dioxide. Okay, and uh, we're going to move to that bit of the PowerPoint too. Okay, so this is the section of your keynotes. So we are at the bottom of page four. Okay which is the effect of carbon dioxide or the Bohr shift, okay? So you're using that bit of your keynotes. I'm going to come back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so we've talked about oxygen concentration affecting the shape of haemoglobin and so its affinity, okay? And we've done that because that's what that graph is all about, changing the concentration of oxygen and you get a change in the shape of the molecule which results in a change in its affinity and so it's got different um, binding properties for oxygen under different conditions but that's not the only factor that affects haemoglobin's affinity so its ability to join to load or unload oxygen okay carbon dioxide is the other gas that does so there's a bit of hints, there's a suggest here. Suggest how it does. Well, the hints are uh, carbon dioxide dissolves to form carbonic acid um, in the blood plasma, uh, lowering its pH. And a reminder that haemoglobin is a protein. So we know pH affects proteins. Hmm. So would it be a surprise to think that a change in pH might change the shape of a protein? No, I wouldn't think so. Not when we know about ionic and hydrogen bonds that might be affected by this change in pH. So the amount of carbon dioxide present 
makes the condition more acidic. So it changes the pH more. Okay, hemoglobin is a protein. When the pH changes, so does the shape of the protein because it affects the bonding in the tertiary structure of the polypeptide chains. When the pH is lower, the shape of the hemoglobin means that it actually loses oxygen more readily. So it unloads. That means it has a lower affinity for oxygen. Okay, and the converse is true of a higher pH, so a lower carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, so this is the challenge. You're going to use this knowledge, sorry, your knowledge of the graph and your information that I've given you here to sketch the effect of a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Right, so we're going to draw an oxygen association curve first of all without carbon dioxide of, well, without, we'll just say at a normal carbon dioxide level. Um, take my pen. So we're drawing the same oxygen association curve. So this is under conditions that we're going to call, we'll not say without, we'll say low carbon dioxide is probably better. Okay, and we'll make that one high carbon dioxide. So this line we're saying represents when the condition is low carbon dioxide. So we know that the bottom is partial pressure of oxygen still and the side is percentage saturation. So what we're saying is this is a normal oxygen dissociation curve that we've seen previously that tells us that at different concentrations of oxygen the haemoglobin has different affinities for oxygen and so a different saturation. So now I've introduced the idea that haemoglobin is a protein and if you increase the carbon dioxide concentration you lower the pH and it changes the shape of the haemoglobin so that it has got always a lower affinity. Okay, so it still behaves the same, but it's got an even lower affinity. So on your graph now, sketch where you think the line should be. Okay, right, let's see if you were right. So we should be sketching the same S shape and it finishes at the same position, but it's always a little bit lower in terms of saturation. So let's put a line on the graph and see what we've drawn. So we've said at the same partial pressure of oxygen, when the haemoglobin, sorry, when the carbon dioxide concentration is high, the haemoglobin saturation is lower. And if it's lower, then that tells you the shape currently has a lower affinity for oxygen. So it's unloading more readily. Okay. Now, why would that be a good thing? That's what we want to think about next. Okay. So as I'll show you, your graph ended up looking a little bit like this. So because carbon dioxide causes the pH to lower and that affects the shape of the protein, it means that the overall affinity of the haemoglobin under high carbon dioxide concentration, so high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, is a little bit lower than under lower carbon dioxide concentration conditions. So we say that this is a shift in the oxygen association curve to the right hand side and the shift is called the Bohr shift after the person who discovered it. So in your key notes then, you've got that description there. So in high concentrations of carbon dioxide, haemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases. Okay, so it's got a lower saturation across the whole of the oxygen dissociation curve graph. So no matter what partial pressure of oxygen, the haemoglobin's got a lower 
affinity that's why it's a lower saturation so that means it looks like the line is kind of shifted to the right so we call this right shift the bore shift okay the more tissues respire the more carbon dioxide they produce that will mean then that there'll be a bigger shift to the right that's really good for those tissues because at those low partial pressures of oxygen now that are high in carbon dioxide you can see it's got an even lower saturation so it really is unloading the oxygen that is of course needed for the respiration okay in the box on the side it does give you a little bit of a why this bore shift happens now this is very much a synoptic question and this is the kind of thing they ask on paper three because this is taking your knowledge um well paper three and paper one taking your knowledge of hemoglobin as a protein and add into it your knowledge of protein structure so why does a ph change cause the affinity to decrease so we know that carbon dioxide dissolves to produce an acid which lowers the ph and we know hemoglobin is a protein a change in ph will alter the charges on the R groups and the positions of the ionic and hydrogen bonds. That'll cause a change in tertiary structure of your polypeptide chains and that's why haemoglobin has a lower affinity to oxygen at higher levels of carbon dioxide. Okay, so now we can do one of the questions in the question pack. Uh, 